Five o'clock, so I'll open this uh, meeting of the City Planning Committee uh, and welcome everybody here. Uh, we have uh, at the committee, we have uh, Alderman Briscoe, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Dutta, Alderman Barakas. Do we have an apology, Jason? Yes, we have Councillor Coates. And Councillor Coates is an apology, right. Uh, I'd advise everybody that um, the audio and video of this meeting is being recorded and live streamed to the community via the City of Hobart YouTube channel. If there are any elected members present who have not yet signed in, well, I think we've all signed in, so um, we're sitting in a COVID safe way. Uh, I request that all mobile devices be either turned off or put to silent. In recognition of the, the deep history and culture of this place, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which the city of Hobart was built. I acknowledge the determination and resilience of the Palawa people of Tasmania who have survived invasion and dispossession and who continue to maintain their identity, culture and rights. I recognise the value of continuing Aboriginal knowledge and cultural practice and pay my respects <coughs> to Elders past, present uh, and any Aboriginal, Aboriginal or Indigenous people who may be here today. We have uh, nobody to co-opt. Um, confirmation of minutes. Councillor Dutta, thank you. Any dissent? If not, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. Item three is consideration of supplementary items, but I don't think there are any. Item four, indications of pecuniary and conflicts of interest. Nil, okay. Item five, transfer of agenda items. Item six, planning items, uh, considering items with deputations. And we have uh, only one on the agenda, which is 83 Melville Street, which is our first item anyway, but can I have somebody move that we yes. consider that? Thank you, Alderman Briscoe. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. So item seven um, is the committee acting as a planning authority and we're considering uh, applications under the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme and we go directly to 7.1.1, which is 83 Melville Street. Um, and uh, the first have a number of representors and I'll ask uh, Ms Louise Bloomfield if you'd like to come to, um, no, you can come and sit down at the, the table here. Thank you. Yes, yep, that's fine. Thanks, and just speak into the, the microphone. I just do it or do I have to yeah, do Just speak into, the, just bring one of the microphones over to you if you like. Oh, oh yep. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And you have five minutes to address the committee with your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd first like to note of concern that UTAS yesterday came out in the Australian newspaper suggesting that should this DA fail, that it's self which I feel is an enormous pressure to put onto this room today. So <coughs> I'd really like to highlight the significance of any conflict of interest because um, I think there will be enormous um, consequences whichever way you guys choose to vote. Now, to go forwards into discussing what I feel is a negative business impact, um, if merely footfall was an indicator of good business income, why is it did only the minimum business trade occur in the existing UTAS vicinity at Sandy Bay campus? Why is it that Birchall's, who was there for years, had to heavily rely on student accounts rather than cash trade? And why is it that there are no high-end shops like Chanel and any other store like that chasing down storefronts to be new UTAS? After all, enormous footfall. With the high cost of living such as rent and uni fees, there is not much likely to be any disposable income available for CBD traders. This is already noted with TAFE students, its current lived experience. If placing educational facilities in the CBD local um, is great for students, why were the TAFE students not interviewed to learn of their real-time issues of parking? 
Hence, we all learnt recently that Office Works often lost um, their own parks to TAFE students because they had no alternative. Why is it that so many TAFE students rely on car transport even though they're already located in the CBD? Ms Bloomfield, um, you realise this is a planning committee and uh, we're considering a development application tonight? Yes, I'm talking about the parking. Um, one of the outcomes of this particular element is that um, it will be removing a number of car parks. In fact, when we looked through the, um, the DA itself, we discovered the best case scenario was the equivalent of removing the entire of the central um, car park. Um, but the expected um, outcome will be potentially removing the equivalent of Argyle Street car park. That is the equivalent vicinity, the equivalent um, resource of parking, which affects small business. Okay, so when we talk about, um, well, okay, if we have no cars coming in because we have now removed these car parks, then we have, um, well, what have we got left? Well, when we lost all the access to um, people outside Hobart, we had a, a test case. We had um, when there was the five kilometre lockdown trade. And even though there were lots of new faces at the Farmgate market, they were down by two thirds. So it does make a difference, not having access easily to parking and transport. In addition to this, um, we also already know too that when parking fees are reduced to nil, we have large numbers of people visiting um, to, because the parks are now competitive. And then when we um, um, increase the fees, it makes them less likely to come in. So it's incredibly financially foolish to plan for a large transport public, public transport solutions when we have nothing particularly on the table right now. Okay, because if the impact hits, it's possible that the Hobart City Council may not be capable of being required um, and liquid. I'm also concerned about the sticky streets. Um, I just came from a meeting where, yet again, we are still discussing the issues of sticky streets in Wellington Court and in Elizabeth Street. Um, if we want to um, use a DA like this, which will increase the number of sticky streets in the area, we are looking at more issues associated with antisocial behaviour. And that's a concern. It's a concern not just for people living in the area, it's a concern for small businesses who find it difficult to trade. Um, so, and, and if we want to look at the actual um, areas that have already been established by UTAS, um, the fake green grass areas established with the TV furniture are barely used, the midtown parklets are barely used, and yet we want to establish something similar in Melville Street. It's important that we look at this. In particular, as, and I'll finish on this, the whole point of the zone area is to maintain and strengthen Hobart CBD with a comprehensive range of the highest order of retail. It would be telling then that an ex-director of traffic engineering from the Hobart City Council felt compelled to put in a letter to the editor outlining the need for serious provision of parking for UTAS. This development displaces too much customer short-term parking as I've explained and outlined. We are talking hundreds of car parks that equivalent will be reduced enormously. That might appear to serve a purpose, but I believe it is going to strip small business from our area. Thank you. Good timing. Thank you. I'll now open it to the committee uh, for questions. And Councillor Data, you have a question? Thank you. Uh, just two questions uh, through you, Chair, to begin with. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Louise, with regards to conflict of interest. And I read your submission paper as well. Uh, in which you uh, refer to the perception of bias. Yes. My question to you is, uh, do you think there is a reasonable apprehension of bias uh, on the part of the elected members and therefore they should disqualify themselves? Even though this I, is not I, a I, I, issue. I have real issue about that, um, in that um, if, you know, and it really got highlighted yesterday with the Australians saying um, that if UTAS can't get this DA through tonight, then they may have to shut up shop. Now, that implies people lose jobs. Now, we already have, for instance, um, Councillor Celinda Sherlock, who has recused herself numerous times for this because she has a job there. But her job's on the line. You know, that's a big deal. 
And, and the other thing is that when you are making this decision, you are looking at um, not just yourselves, but also um, close family members, anyone else who may be directly impacted. If jobs are going, are, are there anyone else around you? Are, do, are there income streams that you know, are a consequence of this? Those things depict to me conflict of interest. The other thing is the way, for instance, the cable car company was treated with the extension and delays and so forth, allowing more time for, for these types of things to come through. Yet consistently we found that we were having, we were struggling to get information, um, the times were maintained and kept short. Um, it, it made us feel very um, disempowered. Um, we certainly have struggled to get the information through and that is also a concern because as you okay. well know, I, I think you've answered the, just the, the question. Action. Have you got your answer, Councillor Dutta? Yeah, th th thank you. Thank yeah, you. Any questions? Uh, I, I'll ask please to give others the opportunity. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any further questions of Ms Bloomfield? Councillor Harvey? Um, Ms Bloomfield, did you, did you read Louise uh, Grimmer's article recently, yes, which had the data, because you haven't provided any data with any regard to anything, uh, you've just you know uh, made assumptions. So how do you how do you um, respond to her data-driven op-ed piece of a week or two ago? I felt that it was highly simplified data, and it was the equivalent of suggesting that if I tell a farmer if he puts in a um, a larger dam to ser service more animals, he'll be able to have more animals to find that they all die because there wasn't enough grass. What I'm trying to say is that she looked at simplistically at footfall predominantly and almost only footfall, but didn't look at the disposable income that actually was also required. So as a result, um, the data itself, it's a little bit um, like we can use statistics, but we must use them um, judiciously, and I do not feel that they were done in the best um, best light. And, and just to follow on, but yes. all the other data from around the world indicates that you're wrong. Well, um, all the data that I have, when we watch North Hobart shrivel and um, and suffer, unable to pay mortgages because the car parks were no longer being able to be used, suggest otherwise, doesn't it? And um, I'd, I'd uh, just call on the committee to, to try and stick to the developed application mm. before us with these questions. Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so you, uh, I think you're fairly persuasive about the, uh, uh, the loss of parking if this development goes ahead to the general um, community, including um, small business in that area. Are you also aware that uh, this development going ahead could displace further retail and other businesses in the area? The problem we have is, like we already see with TAFE students, which are not anal analysed, unfortunately, is that um, basically what happens is um, the parks around are taken up and then it gets pushed out further and further. Uh, my own firm, located in Patrick Street, noticed when car parks three blocks down were removed because people were now parking in front of us and then walking back down. Um, you have people all the way through um, West Hobart, um, North Hobart also complaining already because um, where they used to have access easily to places outside their own homes, that has diminished significantly. So um, because it's only one area, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only that area that's impacted, it spreads its way out. Um, and four to 400 to over 1,000 car park potential displacements is enormous. It's enormous. And that is the displacement we're talking about. You know, we don't have a bus system, yet you're planning and spending money like we have one, but we don't. So what happens? Any further questions? Councillor Data. Thank you, thank you, Chair. My, my, my second question, observing from what you have stated, uh, you referred to the zone, and I understand that you mentioned retail and business to be in that zone. Um, would you agree that this is a mixed zone and therefore you could have a hospital or, you know, at present there are 46 private institutions in the city? 24. Or 46 when I checked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're talking about mixed use as in educational facilities yeah. as well as? 
that's fine, except that we aren't talking about 3,000 to 6,000 students, are we? Um, it's the number of bodies that um, this particular DA will be um, referring to. I don't have those particular numbers right in front of me this second, um, but um, um, a lot of those students um, in those particular establishments aren't quite the um, physical impact, but I do believe they have contributed overall. Um, keep in mind, for instance, when we look at these numbers, um, my understanding is that 12,000 um, international and um, mainland students come into Tasmania every year, 12,000, of which 85% come to southern Tasmania. I believe that's 10,400 students which have had to share our renting facilities, they've had to um, utilise whatever the university has actually facilitated and so on and so forth. Currently, a lot of those are still out in Sandy Bay, but when they come back in, we aren't talking a small number of people, we're talking a large number of people. It makes an impact. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, if you'd like to take your seat again, thank you. Um, now, do we need to wipe down uh, that area between, between people? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I'll now call upon uh, Ms. Uh, Pro uh, Professor Pam Sharp, if you'd like to come to the table. And um, I presume that you'll be making different um, comments from, from Ms. Bloomfield, but you have five minutes to address the committee as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you know, I'm the chair of Save You Towers Campus, and we have requested um, to Rufus Black that um, that uh, work is stopped on this um, university project um, pending the public meeting, but also perhaps more importantly, um, the review that you, the council, decided to have quite recently. So um, personally, I think, well, not just personally, but my group think that um, we can obviously here only cover issues um, that are part of the planning process, but really um, this, is, um, this doesn't make sense when there are so many issues that are beyond the planning process. Um, just, just one of those would be, and, and I'm, I'm mainly going to focus again on on parking because that is such a serious problem with this proposal. There are five car parks and one disabled car park, um, as Louise said, for the 3,300 people to be using the building. And, um, you know, it is possible that um, UTAS might make up for that with a parking at another part of their operations but we don't know that if, if we're discussing each um, part of their proposals on a piece by piece um, basis. This is an extremely unusual proposal. How many other proposals involve developing um, in, in different um, parts of the city? So really this is um, putting the cart before the horse um, very severely, I think. Um, so, um, I can see that, um, and this is from my knowledge of the university, this building is to have business and law in it. Um, I taught many law students who were doing um, joint degrees or taking history courses. They could quite easily get between classes when we were all on a campus. Since then, there have been changes at the university that really mean that students are even more likely to um, move between different um, departments of the university because there have been so many cuts to courses and rationalisations. So I'm really quite unclear how a law student will, certainly in the first few years, were move between um, the, this building here and, and on, the, on the campus without adequate parking. 
I'm extremely concerned about the um, disabled parking situation. Um, we have consulted with um, disability officers on the, on the campus and also with um, uh, disability advocates and um, they have, have all talked about the difficulties of getting around for students both between buildings and within buildings as planned. As we can see, this, um, this um, conversion or repurposing of the forestry building has many uh, circular walls, uh, non-straight walls. It seems to me to have all sorts of hazards um, for the disabled person, particularly people who have difficulty walking. And we found out that UTAS actually has more students of the demographic, um, the, the, the older student, uh, who's more likely to have um, uh, difficulties with, with walking, need to walk more slowly, etc., and certainly need to park um, very near the building where they're studying. So I think this is, this is a very big problem. I've reflected on the, the many universities um, that I had to go to while I, while I had a career at the university. When I visited other universities, I generally um, get to the, um, to, to the university by train. Of course, we have no trains um, and sometimes um, used an unreliable um, bus service. But um, again, I would echo what, um, what Louise Bloomfield just said. Um, we need to have um, improved tra public transport services at least developing in tandem with um, UTAS's uh, plans. Professor Sharp, would you like to, to summarise now? Yes, so I'm, I'm here really as a proxy for Anne Francis. She um, is uh, on holiday and she wanted me to talk about um, traffic and parking in particular, which is what her submission was mainly about. Yes, yeah, so I'll just summarise by giving a, a real life example, and that's the Hedberg, where students um, have told me that they have uh, lecturers leaving in the middle of classes. Classes are typically 50 minutes long, and the lecturers uh, are leaving to move their car because they're in one, one hour parkings. So the lecturer will often disappear for something like 10 or 15 minutes in the middle of a 50 minute class. This is just completely unacceptable and it needs to be um, thought about at this planning stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll open it to the committee to ask any questions. Councillor Data. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, through you once again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pam. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, question number one, you, you have mentioned that uh, uh, your concern about the planning uh, process. Would, would you agree that we have a planning scheme and this is the process whereby we are going through uh, and we are guided by the planning scheme to make our decisions with regards to traffic and the traffic allows for only five spaces which is quite uh, in order. Would you agree? Um, that is, is the case, but I would suggest that that's possibly a, um, some kind of a, a ruling that's been developed for other types of institutions. So much smaller educational institutions, um, possibly, possibly um, uh, schools, I don't know. I, I would be very surprised if it's um, something that was developed with um, university relocation in mind. So that's my answer there. Thank you. And just one uh, other question, Chair, through you. Uh, you mentioned that there will be about 3,000 students. Uh, do you think they'll have 3,000 students per day? H how many do you think will be there for the day? Um, well, I, I think there'll be the, the nature of um, universities today is, is there's a lot of coming and going. That's been very much um, the point made by Rufus in various um, presentations. So without um, having um, modelling done of flows of students, which 
I would have expected to have happened, but often we found um, that UTAS's research and preparation for all this has been not what it should have been. Um, but you would, you would have done some modeling about what the movements are uh, into business, into, um, into law and into corporate services which are going to go in, into this building. And so therefore you've probably got um, staff who are there for most of the day, that would be the corporate services and some of the academic staff and the professional staff and you've got students coming and going. It's really a, a very complex situation that could lead to complete chaos in Melville Street. Thank you. Ordman Briscoe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharp. Um, I th uh, was your uh, point about um, uh, the Educational Institute, part of the decision we have to make tonight is a change of use to educational use. So we have got that power to say this is not appropriate. So with the thesis of your argument is that it's not an appropriate building to uh, repurpose for educational use? Um, I, I, would say, uh, I would say that's correct. I'm all for the repurposing of heritage buildings, but I would have thought this one would be more suitable to be um, a, sh a, shopping cent a, a shopping centre, um, perhaps a hotel, perhaps high-end housing. Um, I don't see it as being um, really ideally suitable um, to be part of a university. That's correct. Thank you very much, Professor Sharp. And I just have uh, one question. So you, you gave that example of, uh, was it a lecturer at the Hedberg yeah. Centre who, who knew that they would have a lecture of however long, and yet they still couldn't plan to to move their car or have 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 their um, the way that they got to to their job uh, planned for. Well, they couldn't find parking that that met their needs at the time when they when they needed it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thanks for making all of those points. Um, if you'd like to take your seat, thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll uh, call uh, Robert Morris Nunn to address the committee. Thank you. Do you want me to sit out there? Uh, no, you, if you, if, well, you could, oh, but you can sit I wherever. Stand but if you, want. you can sit um, just where there is a microphone. Thank you. Yes. That's to address the committee. Thank you. Thank you. I presume that you, the committee gets to read all the representations and things that they're formally handed out to you. So, yes. a nod from you. Uh, thank you. So, I won't go over what I wrote. Uh, but essentially, I was obviously the architect of the original building in the 1990s. And that, uh, the sale of that building to uh, Robert Rockefeller sort of produced in my view, an incredibly distressful situation where the, where the soul of the building was somewhat gutted. Uh, and I was pretty gutted too. I think what's actually been done by the university to actually reinstate a lot of the spirit of what I had put there in the first instance is fairly exemplary. And I think the actual conversion of that building to what, to, I'm not directly involved in the architectural side of it, except to advise on it heritage matters, but I think the actual conversion is a fairly exemplary one of taking on some of the ideas that I proposed 25 years ago and, and taking them through the building. And I think what will actually pro be produced if this does go ahead um, is in fact a very, very worthy building for the whole of the city of Hobart. Thank that's you. my five minutes worth. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Uh, are there any questions? Alderman Briscoe? Yeah. Whilst I uh, applaud you with your uh, artistic and architectural uh, head, uh, hat on and uh, you think your um, vision back in whenever you did the um, refurbishing, um, can you see that even though uh, there would, could be other developments that could equally um, achieve your same 
I do. Well, supposedly Robert Rockefeller tried. Um, and, and look, I can only comment on what's been put forward. But what's been put forward in, is, in my view, far better than I imagined it might have been. I was quite honestly fearful, um, given, given what had happened. Um, but the restoration of the forest, which I think back then was a really exemplary bit of urban planning uh, um, in terms of putting the urban forest in there, that's going to be reinstated. And a lot of the actual sort of uh, horticultural elements are going to be going right through the entire rest of the building, which I had hoped for, but civil and civic during the early 90s had pulled out. So, so there was, a, there was some intense that I had back then that in fact is actually coming to pass in this present manifestation, which I hadn't been able to achieve in the 1990s. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, Professor Morris Nunn, just in relation to the, the walkway, um, have you got any comments in relation to that link with Brisbane Street? Um, that was discussed with me whether that, uh, the aerial linking across, the, how important that was. It, it is an element of the space. I think uh, it becomes a, a strange element when you take the forest away from it. Um, it looks extremely bald and really odd at the moment. Um, for me, it's not mandatory to, to stay there. Um, I believe the levels that they've had to sort of adjust um, to make the different, different uh, parts of the building work and the way that the internal circulation works. It's a, different, it's, a, it's a different number of students that are going to be moving through the building. It's a different sort of nature of it. Um, I'm not personally too fussed if it goes. Yeah, okay, all right, thank you. If, any further questions? So if you'd like to take your seat and thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we'll go now to Mr. Michael Bailey from the TCCI who's joining us via Zoom. Thanks, uh, Mr. Bailey, if you, you've got five minutes to make your, your case. Just can't hear you. That's uh, it. Sorry, all that uh, the typical Zoom thing of not unmuting it properly. Look, thank you so much, Chair, for the opportunity to present via Zoom too. Unfortunately, a PCR test today has uh, put me into, into isolation. Uh, look, I suppose what I want to talk about very briefly initially is why the TCCI supports this move. Uh, we've supported the move of the university into the cities of Burnie, Launceston and Hobart now for over a decade. And the reason for that is more than just you know, the build, it's more than just the economic benefit to local businesses. Uh, it's primarily about really bringing the city or bringing the university to the city so that people come to the university. You know, we need to increase the numbers of people going to University of Tasmania. We need to increase productivity in our state. And we know that integrating the university in the city will do just that. What we also know is that the infrastructure in the university campuses is ageing, and more importantly, the way that students learn has changed. We know that, for example, my new policy person who has just graduated uh, with uh, masters in law, as well as business, as well as international business, didn't go to a single lecture. Uh, he listened to his lectures online and went to every single tute. So the days of academics standing in front of large groups of kids talking to them has ended. Uh, this is a perfect building to integrate those students with the business world around them. What I'm looking forward to in this build is being able to work more closely with the university to integrate their students into the business community. Having the students in the city around business is a perfect, perfect place for them. Uh, we also know the university has benefited the businesses in the areas that it's actually gone into. The great example of that is the northern part of the Elizabeth Street Mall. Now, we all remember what that used to be like uh, with the student accommodation there now. The, unit, the businesses have completely transformed and people are making good money in that space. Um, I love the fact that we have international and mainland students coming to Tasmania for a number of reasons. First, they bring new money into our state, but as importantly, we know that at least once a year, their parents generally come to Tasmania to visit them, and they bring money with them when they come to our state. So more than just the economics of it, though, again, is the increase in productivity of having the university in the CBDs. Uh, I was really buoyed by um, the 
the review of the planning application by your team and really respect the fact that they are supporting it. I, I agree with them too. I think it's a terrific application. On parking, I'd just like to note that the current parking at Sandy Bay allows for a thousand car parks. The new parking in the city allows for 1,600 car parks. So in fact, uh, as far as the university goes, there'll be more car parks available. But what's more important is the work of the university to try and change people from travelling in cars to travel in other forms of transport, whether that be walking or bikes or buses. Uh, so they're really important considerations. But we know too that having multiple amounts of people through the city will increase business. It's happened already, it will happen again. We know that having the teachers or the, the academic staff as well as the admin staff as well as the students will be a boom for the CBD of Hobart. Uh, again, I, I respect greatly the work that your team has done on this and support wholeheartedly uh, their approval of the DA. Thank you very much. I'll open it to the committee for questions and we'll start with you, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Interesting, um, you say it's going to be a boom. Is there any studies that you know of, because I don't know of any studies, that have indicated the current proposal to move into the city is going to be a boom, apart from the assertions that you've just made? Well, I don't know about any studies other than having spoken to the businesses going through that area. Uh, and certainly not just looking at the transformation of that part of the city, and I think we can all hand on heart say that that has been you know, spectacular seeing how that has transformed. But again, talking to the businesses about how that excited they are, um, not all, but most are, about the opportunity that will bring them. Uh, so again, we know that the universities bring business to CBDs. That's an established fact, and no doubt the university has spoken to you about that before as well. Um, again, what's exciting here is the opportunity, though, to increase the amount of people going to university, and that is the key for our state. We know that having universities away in suburbs doesn't help that. We need to integrate universities with cities, and that will in turn bring people to universities. Uh, I wonder if I could have a follow-up question. Yes, certainly. Uh, you, you're aware that Freedom Furniture will be closing in September, putting 18 people out of a job. So how could the local businesses be um, delighted about that? Mr Bailey? Well, the businesses, again, the businesses I speak to tell me that they see the opportunity that thousands of people will bring uh, coming through there or past their front door will bring to them. Good businesses always find a way. Now businesses come and go and we know that, but good businesses always find a way. And the benefit of multitudes of people close to your business is evident. Just a matter of finding you know, the right key for those people. Yeah, well, just one further question for you, Chair. Uh, it seems like uh, the evidence demonstrates elsewhere that when you bring uh, people who live in the city, then certainly you would have an increase in economic activity. But as uh, um, uh, Louise Broomfield said earlier tonight um, that uh, students are, are not necessarily the most cashed up people um, and therefore if but however if this property for example was used for residential purposes then you would get people into the city uh, that would use local businesses so what would your response to be that that it could be a better use for this site than the university well, again, we've got a use, a use on the table. There's a, a planning application on the table. So my, my uh, comment would be, I think that's the thing that needs to be addressed in the planning committee. Uh, yeah, the strategy around university moving to the city is one, again, that's evident. We're trying to increase productivity. We're trying to also uh, grow the economy, which will happen. Uh, you know, I know plenty of students with plenty of money, but I know plenty of academics with a lot more money. Uh, having thousands of academics on my front doorstep of old business, I'd be doing cartwheels alone, let alone the students, let alone their parents. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr yeah, Bailey. Can I just, I will oh, ask one. Councillor yeah. Harvey. Michael, um, how do you see the, the, the relevance of international students in the city with regard to the local economy? From my perspective, Absolutely. I see they, yeah. they, make, they make hospitality viable in Tasmania or in Hobart. I think they're critical for a whole range of reasons. Firstly, they bring new money um, to, to the economy. Again, they do uh, obviously provide um, fantastic service to a lot of our members as far as staffing goes, but more importantly, out of vibrancy to our communities that we desperately need in an isolated island state. You know, the international students are fabulous. You know, we know that they firstly are paying in cash uh, for their studies. We know that their parents come to visit them, bringing money to enjoy in our state. 
uh, there is all upside from having international students in our community. And as I said, it brings a, a vibrancy to our community that we don't get otherwise. It's really important. And, uh, and I'd love to see the transition right across Tasmania that's come from more international students coming to our shores. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we, um, we have the applicant um, and we have uh, David Clark, who's the Chief Operating Officer of UTAS, Bruno Mendes via Zoom, uh, the project architect with Woods Baggett and Fraser Reid from All Urban Planning. So if you'd like to come to the table and, mm. and just um, um, have yourselves around the, the microphones, if you will. And have we, have we the architect from, no, the architect's not, not zooming in? Uh, I believe he was, but he's not there. So, um, have you, ha can somebody contact him or? Things on the chat, I don't know if he's a message. Craig, have you, have you got, no, so we haven't, haven't got him. The, <coughs> so we, perhaps if, uh, whilst you can start and we can just um, try and get some, if some of the questions, I suppose, that you've already had uh, presented by the representors or the other deputations. <coughs> perhaps you can answer some of those questions. Um, I'll just cover off on the, the planning scheme issues first. Yeah, um, thank you. So, Fraser Reid, planning, planning matters. Um, the key things, uh, I suppose, for Council to think about in terms of this planning application are, of course, what, what's the use status? Um, um, the use status is permitted in this, um, in this zone, um, meaning that it is a use that, that Council um, prefers in this area, in this zone and indeed is, is bound to approve in terms of a use perspective. Um, so in terms of um, car parking, as you're well aware, the planning scheme doesn't require car parking in this location. Um, other matters of discretion relate to heritage. Um, uh, the officer report is obviously very positive on those matters. Um, so from a planning perspective, I don't really um, intend to say anything further. I'm happy to answer any questions, but you have your officer report uh, in support, obviously. I might pass to Dave. Thanks, Fraser. Uh, so, Chair, I might just address a couple of the questions that have been raised tonight, particularly around the number of students and staff moving in and also the car parking as well that uh, the university is tending to put across. Can I just get you to make sure that you're speaking into the mics, please, because it's a little that, bit hard uh, to hear. Is that better? Yep. I'll I think so, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to talk about uh, the staff and students coming into uh, 83 Melville Street, but also talk about car parking as it's planned across the university sites in the city, because I think that will address some of the concerns that have been raised. So into um, uh, the new forestry and freedom joint development, we will have around 1,850 EFSL or equivalent full-time students going in. At the moment, there are 1,500 of those 1,850 that are already studying in the city. Uh, the business and economics uh, students are already in there, being taught uh, in lease premises, so at the KPMG building and also at Vodafone. So the remainder, the 350, relates to our law students that will be coming in um, once the facility opens. Um, in terms of staff, there's about 270 staff that would be in the building. Um, around 180 of those are administrative staff that we based in the Freedom site and the remainder are the, um, uh, the academics who will be going into the forestry building. And again, um, a good chunk of those academics are already in the city because they're teaching um, a lot of the, uh, the business students in there. Um, in terms of the car parking, while the forestry and freedom buildings don't have um, car parks other than mobility spaces available, it is the intent that the university will be looking to engage with council around significant car parking being made of, available at both the current uh, K and D site, uh, which is where we're intending to put our STEM facilities, our science uh, and engineering facilities, and at the Webster's ca uh, car park site, which is where we're going to be building a library and our humanities um, uh, will be based as well. So we will have the ability to go down um, under our development at uh, K&D, the K&D site, 
and have up to two um, floor plates, each of which can take uh, around 400 cars if that's what we chose to do. And again, this is in accordance will be with council and working through what demand looks like at that point in time. And also at Webster's, we could do two underground car levels out of it with around 200 each. So that's at 400 at um, the Webster site, 800 at the K&D site, which is 1,200. On top of that, we've got access to um, uh, a quarry off the Brooker Highway, which backs onto um, the domain site, where we could increase the car parking capacity there um, to 120. Um, and so, and then with our existing car spots under the Hobart Apartments, which are around 220, um, we will have, um, to what Michael Bailey referred to before, are up, the ability to put in up to uh, 1,600 car spots in the city. Now, I'm not suggesting we would do that, but that is the abilities that, uh, and um, the supply that could be made available if the Hobart City Council and ourselves in collaboration decided that's what was required. I will say with any car parking that's put into the city, it will be convertible. So the university is very firmly of the opinion that over time, the need for car parking will diminish. And so all of our car parks will be convertible into teaching and learning or office um, facilities over time. So that will be part of the strategy. Another way um, that we'll be dealing, so one of the questions that has been raised as well is that the two big developments I spoke of at K&D and Webster's won't come online <coughs> until after the forestry building is up and running. So the question is, what do we do in the interim? So in the interim, the, the intent is very much that we'd be offering a uh, park and ride from Sandy Bay, which does have uh, car parking. Sandy Bay, by the way, has around 1,000 car parks on campus. And what we're talking about is the ability to go up well beyond that in the city. Uh, we'll also be able to use the current uh, car parking that we've got on the Webster site at the moment, which is 180. Um, and we can, we've got the ability to timetable classes so that we obviously avoid uh, peak periods with traffic as well, which is what we're looking to do with our academics. So in terms of car parking, I think university has a strategy which should um, cover concerns. All right, thank you. Um, I think in, in fairness, um, we'll go to questions now and uh, hopefully we can get some of the, the answers that might might be required. And we'll start with you, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I know uh, it is a very topical issue and uh, you've uh, kept very professional with it. So uh, um, whilst uh, I, uh, I feel um, a little bit comforted by um, that you are listing the car parking possibilities. Um, you've, we've heard tonight that um, you could say no to that when the building is built. You could say it's not required under the planning scheme, therefore we don't have to do that. What, what commitments could you give to us tonight, or shortly after tonight, that, um, that uh, the 1,600 possible car parks will be available? because you could say, rightly say it, the planning scheme doesn't require it. We're not considering 1,600 car parks tonight. So, so in terms of comments, we'd be happy to talk to the officers of um, the council to have a conversation around a process to determine an appropriate number of car spots um, across our campus or the, the buildings that will comprise the campus in the city. Um, and that will be part of a process that we would naturally go through anyway. So you, you can't commit tonight that you will have definitely uh, addressed the parking issue? So tonight I can say that the university will be putting into its buildings, its total campus in the city, sufficient car parks to meet the requirements of the council uh, officers, suggestion of the council officers, um, when those conversations take place. So we will be putting car park parks into our two big builds at K&D and Webster's. Um, just a follow through question, and I uh, thank you for that answer. Um, why didn't you consider car parks at this site? Because that's, this site didn't lend itself to car parks. It was a refurbishment. Those two sites I spoke of are new builds, so they will be, there is the ability to go down underground to, to position car parks there. This, this would be an incredibly expensive um, uh, project if we wanted to go and put, try and put car parking below ground at uh, an existing building. Good, thank you. And Barakas. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and through you. So obviously the big issue with this, there's a lot of um, peripheral issues, but the, the issue with this particular application is mainly parking. Um, 
So what did you say the number of parking spots at the existing Sandy Bay campus? The existing Sandy Bay campus is around a thousand. And and how many and this and what faculties are going in there again? In here? Into the new build. Um, we've got um, a College of Business and Economics is going in and the School of Law. Um, and how many spots again I think you did say are going into the K and D side? The, the K and D, um, each floor of car parking that we've put in could take approximately 400 cars. Um, and then you said there was another one up the road, further up the road. Yeah, so that, where we'd be putting that, that which is 200 the... per floor. Um, okay, so if the expectation then is that there's going to be more parking going up that, that's what you're, you're, you're playing. I know you said as far as the commitment, what would you be, you know, there's, there's a maximum, I think you suggested of about 1,600, did you say, what would you be expecting that would be reasonably ho hoping to see built? Is so, it, so one of the is that is the sixteen hundred an ambitious. No. So sixteen hundred is um, certainly possible on both sides, uh, combined with what we've already got in the city. Um, but what we'd be really keen to do is to obviously we, we need to understand um, what what the council would see as um, an appropriate level of parking to support the Greater Hobart plan that they're looking at at the moment, the precinct plan, um, and what's proposed in that because that will have some bearing on this as well. Um, but we, we, like I said, we will be making sure that we have sufficient car spots in these two buildings and we do have the ability to go to that 1600 if necessary um, to support the new campus in the city. What's, sorry, I've got a, I've got a couple mm, of questions, sure. apologies. What's the current capacity at the K&D site at the moment, undeveloped? Uh, so yeah. undeveloped right now, I'm just turning around, that would be about, probably about, I'd say about 80 on top. That's guesstimate. And, and these ones and the ones that you're expecting to develop, if there is a, at any given time, a surplus of parking, um, there's less students than, 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 than staff, would these be open to the public to access? Yes, so one of the things we're looking through is absolutely having a really flexible parking arrangement in place. So during um, hours in which lectures would normally and tutorials would normally be held, we'd obviously try to dedicate them for staff and students. Um, but there's a lot of hours outside of um, university time and including holidays where we would make them available. Finally, and this might be one I have to ask the officers as well because I don't know if it's something that we could even do. Uh, you did say that to avoid traffic impacts or to, to try and address traffic impacts that um, you'd, you'd be working with the scheduling. Would, would that be something that you'd be willing to entertain as far as a condition if we're able to, if we're able to do that as far as not having classes at 8.30 a.m. when when, when traffic's going to be at its worst? So we'd certainly be comfortable in sharing what our thinking is around this and, and working with the city to put in place um, a schedule that works for both our academics and for the, to, to help with um, traffic congestion. Okay. But I don't know if we want to, as a condition, I, I'm, yep, okay. I don't think it needs to be a condition, I think it's just a conversation and an agreement around it. All right, that's, that's it for me. Thank Councillor Data, then uh, Councillor Hart. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, with, with regards to parking for this particular development application, you know, you're not required under the planning scheme to provide the parking. Now, in the future then, uh, there is no requirement, as it were, to have parking at K&D or Webster's. Would you agree with that? And therefore, if it's not required, you'll be able to say, no, we won't provide it. So, so I think the university's got a good track record of working with council and honouring its commitments without having them uh, put in as obligations. So we have a commitment in place to play, pay the rates equivalency. We don't need to and we've agreed to do that and we're doing that. I think with car parking as well, we could have a, an agreement that's put in place like a non-binding memorandum could be put up which would say that we would be looking to make sure that the number of car parks there um, in consultation with the officers of the, the council were sufficient and, and necessary. We'd be putting in place the necessary number of car parks. And if we had to go that high, then we'd have to go that high. Thank you. And just one more question. Um, you, you also mentioned about park and ride. Now, uh, is it not possible for you not to shift, but to provide the same service for students from here to there? Uh, yes, that's right. So we run buses, at, shuttle buses at the moment, in and out of town all the time. All right, so, so what you're saying is that when you have students here, you will have a park and ride from 
Sandy Bay to the city? Uh, so we will be offering park and rides. We do now. So we have um, bus links, university um, mini buses, if you like, that run very regularly between Sandy Bay and the city. Thank you. That's Lahavi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Could you just repeat that figure again? You've, the, the number of students that will be using this new facility, if it's approved, is, I think you said 1,800 or so, but already 1,350 of those are in the city already. Yes, yeah, so there's 1,850 equivalent yep. full-time students that will be using it. Yep. 1,500 of those are already sort of studying in the city now. So they're the... Um, so change buildings. That has changed buildings. And okay. then all the law students will be coming in, so there's about 350 equivalent full-time students. So it's there. only an additional 350 students. Okay, yep. Um, just with regard to transport options, I know, noticed from one of the UTAS reports there's a big difference in the number of staff and st or how staff and students access the city versus how they access Sandy Bay. Could you just go through some of those figures for us, if you can remember? If it's all right, um, I might ask my colleague uh, Penny to come up here because Penny was involved with that study, yep. so she'd be well placed to, to answer that. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. So we know um, since 2013, every two years, we've been surveying all of our students and staff um, to understand how they get to university uh, and what methods of transport transport they actually use. Um, so we have a clear sort of database uh, that's evolved over time. And what we see from our staff and students who um, work in Sandy Bay compared to those who, who work in um, the CBD is there's around 20% differential between those who use cars to drive to Sandy Bay compared to those who use cars to drive to the, uh, to the CBD. Um, what we find interesting is those, and that's consistent from both staff and students, and the numbers fluctuate, but it's around 20 to 25 per cent consistently in all of the surveys that we've actually done. We've seen over time that our increase in um, bus usage in both staff and students has continued to rise. Um, and what we see is one of the big differentials compared to Sandy Bay to the city is the amount of people using active transport choices. So walking, biking, because of the bike paths that go all the way through to the northern suburbs, um, and using uh, buses into the CBD as well. So a larger number of staff and students are accessing the city by alternative not driving versus what's going on in Sandy Bay, okay. Uh, my third question is with regard to disability access. That was raised, I think, by a couple of the um, representors that they were challenging the, 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 um, the level of disability access. I'm assuming that everything's got to meet code. So um, could you just respond to those issues? Well, in terms of um, accessible parking, yes, it needs to be to the dimension required. In terms of the number of spaces, it needs to... Um, well, the general approach is to have the, the right number for the BCA requirement. In the CBD, that might be a bit different, but I suppose there's some flexibility in this parking. Perhaps if there's six spaces there and it's a requirement for some more accessible parking, you can probably provide that in addition to council's on-street supply. So, um, that's probably the answer. And that's, that's half. Yeah, please, would you mind speaking up? It's just a little bit he hard to hear. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Disability parking, but also within the building, because there was mention that some of the curved walls might have uh, cause issues and things like that. Well, is that also something that will need to be compliant? Can you have curved walls and ramps versus lifts or whatever else is required? I'm assuming well, it'll need to comply with the yeah. building code. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's the, the answer I expected. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Norman Briscoe. Uh, yes. Just another question, uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, following on about your your. Uh, your offer to work with the city to get some appropriate parking requirement in future developments. Um, did I read somewhere that you had signed a lease for the K&D, I think it was either five years or seven years for the current users of that facility? The, Swish the, uh, the current user uh, of the facility is Swisher, of which the university is a 50% shareholder. So the university um, in agreement with Swisher has with um, Swisher's uh, agreement, has the ability to 
um, you know, manage the tenure in the building. So that's not going to be, I don't think, a major issue. Okay, I'm just sort of getting an idea of the timing of this. Like, it, if, if you get approval, uh, two years to build, I presume you'll start straight away. That's, I'm told you, you're cashed up. And um, at the same time, will you be putting an application in for the building on K and D site? So we have some idea um, how different your, your building will be done in K and D. Uh, sorry, uh, building you're done in the old forestry building, and at the same time, the parking would have to be started at the K and D site. So obviously, um, you would. have appreciate Ormond Briscoe that it's um, it's a lot of effort to work on just one of, one of these developments in isolation. So we will be starting the next one after this one has passed through the council processes. Um, and the next build that we'll be looking at is most likely going to be the Webster site and then very shortly afterwards. And so it won't be in series, it'll be in parallel. We'll be starting the K&D one. Uh, but there is a these are these are complex builds, as you would appreciate, yeah. and they will require um, a good couple of years, I would have thought, to get things sorted. Um, so, to, as a follow-up, so can you see a period of time when your offer of additional parking would not come online for a, a number of years after the cane, uh, the um, forestry building was redeveloped? So that's why I referenced the interim parking arrangements. So I spoke about park and ride. I spoke about the fact that we've got 180 car parks already available, uh, most of which are vacant, just about all, sitting up at our Webster's site, which will be there. Okay. Um, we've got 220 car parks under the student apartments, of which 102 um, sit there for public uh, consumption or use, and there's about a 30% occupancy, so 70 car parks there. I think the, the so council got enough, own, own some of that, don't they? Uh, so, the, who, sorry? the council owns some of those car no, parks. No, 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 there's a lease from us for a 10-year period right. that was put in place. Just, just while I, I'm parking, because it is the most important issue, um, I'd love to talk about the educational thing, but I think in this case it's city planning. Um, you mentioned a quarry that backs on the domain. Now that quarry is owned by the Hobart City Council, isn't it? No, not that one. Uh, which which quarry are you talking about? Uh, so it's, part, it's just below the Philip Smith building. Just below the Philip Smith the car park. Yeah, the, car, the car park there, yes. yes. It's an existing car park, and so the intention would be to go down and maybe up one level. Right, OK, thank you. Still, obviously, well below the, the height. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'm, I've got two short questions. Then I'll, I might uh, ask a few. Okay. Um, th there's no need for a change of use on this site, is there? It was implied earlier that we needed to decide on the change of use. That's not correct? It, it, if there was no development at all, you could just change from an office to an educational use without any permit at all, for example. Um, but the actual proposed use of an educational establishment is a permitted use um, that basically has to be approved. Yeah. Okay, because it was implied we could vote against the use. Anyway, okay. The, and the, the final question, the, there's 220 car parks below the Elizabeth Street student accommodation. Uh, that was a dusty car park when you purchased it from council. How many car parks was it then? Can you remember? You might know also. Mr. Noy, how many car parks were on that site? Be remarkable to see if you remember that. <laughs> my, my guess was about 80. Where were we talking? It was behind the Black Prince that used to. Melville Street car park. The old days, that was what oh, was where that pub. Yeah. It the, wasn't very big. Yeah. The Melville Street car park, I think, held about 80 cars, and now it holds 220. So the university actually increased the number of parking in the, in the city with the student accommodation. That's the point I'm trying to make. We might take that on notice if yeah. you don't have the answers. Yep. Okay. Right. All right. So, um, uh, as Alderman Briscoe uh, has said, um, you know, the, the issues around transport, parking, um, the follow-on follow of congestion has been raised um, quite a lot in, in the representations that we've received. Um, and I... I understand you've you've addressed some of those um, those concerns. When is the university likely to to have a more sort of composite um, 
uh, study, and I think that's that's what I'm reading between the lines for for some of these um, representors as well. So w when are you likely to have more of a an overall um, traffic impact? Um, so there's a number of issues, um, Deputy Mayor. Can Sorry. you hear me okay? Can you hear me better now? Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I think there's there's a number of uh, things that we're working on and very conscious of as well, uh, not least of which is the uh, the City of Hobart's um, City Precincts Plan and um, engagement that's going on uh, over the coming months, as well as the uh, Metro Plan from State Growth as well. Mm -hmm. So we're very clear that we need to work in conjunction with the City um, and, uh, and State Growth to make sure what we do is the right outcome in terms of traffic, congestion, and the needs of our, um, our staff um, and students for parking. So we have done traffic modelling surveys. Um, we did that in um, 2019 as part of the decision to move to the, um, to consolidate in the CBD. Um, and that was done on a preliminary concept of, um, of the, the CBD. Um, that was submitted to um, the Legislative Council for their inquiry into traffic. Mm. Uh, we've done subsequent ones as well, um, in particular associated with the uh, Sandy Bay um, Master Plan that's um, work that's been underway for the last 12 months. We also, when it comes to parking, understand very clearly because of the traffic um, studies we've done with our staff and students, exactly how many um, spots, parking spots we require for our staff and students. And so we have a fairly clear view um, as to what that number is and how many staff and students would be on buses, on bikes, walking, um, and you know, people still need the flexibility to use cars. Um, so we have, as Dave has said, we have options um, and that's what we want to work on with the city uh, and state growth to make sure those numbers are the right numbers for to meet the demand of, uh, of parking, but not overwhelm the city with traffic. And so, uh, and the, uh, you, you mentioned the the uh, city of Hobart or the city inner city precincts plan, and and um, so there's quite a lot of um, potential for thousands more people to to live in the city, um, and, and presumably that would mean that that some of those transport issues would be uh, less less of an impact. Yeah. But, um, but essentially, your, uh, I suppose my first question was really around uh, the availability of that information and modelling to satisfy some of the, or satisfy some of the concerns that people who are writing to us have. So are you making that available forthwith or it's already on the website? Uh, it's already on the website and it's already on the, um, the, the state government or the, the parliamentary uh, website as well. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, just in relation to um, the disability access, so two questions. One is around, so the, the, the five car parking spaces, obviously there is a demand, as I think Professor Sharp raised, uh, in relation to students and staff who, who may have disabilities and require that access. So are all those car parks disability access car parks? Or is it just one out of the five? They're not at the moment. Um, they're not at the moment, but if that your question is, could they all be, yep. maybe that's something we'd have to take on notice, I think. Right. I'd probably yeah. need to understand the... Um, I don't know what sort of discussions you've had with, with planning staff, but one would assume that that would, might be a good idea. <laughs> um, and in regards to access around uh, the building and floor levels uh, and making sure that people can get from one floor to the to the next how how easy will that be and the gradient up to Brisbane Street can you just uh, address some of those uh, you know the the issue around uh, ac ac access in a in a wheelchair for argument's sake uh, look I'm only able to speak to those things at a reasonably high level um, but obviously the building has to be designed to to meet code in terms of accessibility um, and um, you, know, you know travel pass through the building so it, it will meet the standard that it's required to um, and I know it was something that was carefully considered um, um, following the urban design advisory panels um, feedback so that's something that 
um, the project's very aware of. Yeah, and if I could uh, add, uh, Chair, the um, accessibility and level access is a core part of the design principles when we approach the building to make sure that um, level access, equal access was, um, was an inherent right, that no one had to go around the back or the side of the building to actually enter. So we have ensured that um, the, the access ramps, the um, uh, entrance both from Brisbane Street and from uh, Melville Street um, is uh, facilitated for people who are in wheelchairs or who, are, who may have mobility issues. The, the, the issue was raised um, at a, uh, th during public question time uh, also uh, from, from somebody who I think was a former student um, and who, you know, who, who was, the premise seems to be that the, the access will be better than it is in Sandy Bay. So it would be very good if, if it were. Yes. No, ab absolutely. It's one of the, um, the key challenges we have with the Sandy Bay site. One is the gradient across the site makes it very difficult for people to transition from building to building, uh, but also a lot of the buildings were not designed uh, for people in wheelchairs, so a lot of the, the corridors, the elevators, <coughs> and just purely the, uh, the entrance into a number of buildings is just not... Um, Okay, and you're saying that that gradient to to Brisbane Street from the forest, ex forestry building is <coughs> is suitable and okay. Yes, that's what the architects have been working on. Yeah, all right. Okay, if there are no further questions, and your your architect didn't didn't um, arrive. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, um, so hopefully the, those questions uh, or those answers satisfy the, the committee. So if you'd like to take your seats again, thank you very much. And um, are there any questions of, of uh, Mr Noy? Alderman Barakas, and I'll open the item for discussion. Thank, thank you, Chair, and, and, and through you to the Director. Just as per my questions to the, um, to the applicants just earlier, would we have the ability to place any conditions on the scheduling of the classes or is that something that would only be advice? Um, through you, Chair, uh, it's a permitted use and as, as previously mentioned, we are bound to approve the application, but we could include advice um, around the issue that you have raised. Um, it's, it's ultimately up to the uh, university to determine their, their scheduling. Um, it, in, in relation to that. I'm not going to move this yet, but I might put the suggestion out there that we include that as advice when, when, if, if and when it is moved in support. So, so what was the, the that, suggestion? That, that, that the scheduling of, of classes um, is such that it doesn't, um, it, do, it doesn't occur during peak hour times. M minimise um, the need for access during peak periods. Can I make another suggestion for advice? Because uh, I won't move the motion, but... Um, no, through you, Chair, to the yes, director. Sure. Um, is it, uh, uh, is it it'd be lovely to put a condition that the university have to provide up to 1,600 car parks subject to the office's uh, um, approval, but I'm sure that's probably not allowed because uh, they're referring to the, um, uh, the parking on other sites. So uh, an advice clause such as uh, noting that the university has committed, committed to work with the city to um, to provide appropriate levels of parking at other sites. Could that be an advice clause? Uh, um, through, you, you, through you, Chair, yes, I think uh, that would be fine as advice that uh, we acknowledge the university's commitment to work with council and council officers so far as uh, parking provision. Yeah, good. So whoever's going to move the motion, which I presume is going to be Alderman Harvey, no, uh, Councillor Harvey, I'm hoping you include that as advice. Councillor Harvey. <laughs> um, I think what Alderman Barakas is referring to is the, is the travel management plan, which I think we've talked about and had workshops on in the past. And I would assume that the, the university is all over that sort of um, um, strategy, that they would be working towards that um, because they're in the zone of doing their two-year studies on or, or surveys on how people travel to and from the various campuses. So I guess that's already, you know, I mean, even though I'm, I'm happy to include that as advice. And what was yours again, Paul? Uh, just going? Uh, note, note that the university's commitment to work with the council officers um, to provide extra car parking 
Um, well, at suitable, suitable level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't refer to 1600. It doesn't refer. And it doesn't commit to anything. Well, yeah. it commits to further discussion. That's right. Oh, it may commit to a further discussion. Yeah. It's an advice. Well, I'm happy to include that as well okay. for Alderman Briscoe's benefit. Uh, for the public's benefit. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's also given as well. Like the, 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 the staff don't work in a vacuum. Of course, we're communicating with the proponents on all levels and transport, traffic and um, travel management, I assume, is part of that negotiation or part of that dialogue we have with the university. So I will move the item, Lord Mayor, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, for, for approval. Thank you. Councillor Dutta. With the addition of those advice, Thank advice clauses, they're, they're, they're fairly harmless. Um, so I'm happy to include those in. Councillor Dutta. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you to the director. Uh, in the report that we have, um, I refer to page 50, uh, attachment A, and uh, 6.9, excavation and 6.9.1 mentions about uh, acceptable solution and then further down in 694 it mentions about the performance criteria close to 62p1 now i just need a clarification with regards to this it says excavation does not adversely impact on health and the environment having regard to a an environmental site assessment that demonstrate there is no evidence the land is contaminated, or B, to plan to manage contamination associated risks to human health and the environment that includes uh, A, uh, 1, 2, and 3. Now, my point here is at 6.9.5, it states that referral was made to Council Environmental Health Officer who assessed the proposal as meeting the performance criteria subject to a condition requiring submission of a full environmental site assessment. Now, if I am to make a decision, why is it that I don't have this environmental site, site assessment? Mr. Noy? Yes, uh, Chair. Look, a preliminary assessment has been made, and based on that preliminary assessment and based on the condition requiring a, a comprehensive um, management plan to be undertaken, uh, we are satisfied that that performance criteria is met based on those two, um, based on the information that's been supplied and, and based on the, um, the condition of approval that we are recommending for imposition. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Just one more question, please, Chair. Now, I um, also note that uh, with regards to storm water management, um, why is it, again, that there is no, uh, rep no management uh, plan given to us? Is it, is it similar to what you've answered before? Yeah, look, the, there is, has been information provided so far as storm water is concerned. However, not the detailed design solutions. They would normally come like... Um, um, you know, the detailed building plans would come at the building approval stage or prior to the building approval stage. Uh, it's not necessary for that detailed design to be provided as part of a planning application. Just the sufficient evidence to uh, demonstrate that a solution can be found. Mr Noy, I have a couple of questions. Um, the Urban Advisory, Urban Development Advisory Panel. Urban Design Advisory Panel. Urban Design Advisory Panel um, talked about the, the issue of entrapment with the Brisbane Street, uh, the lane off Brisbane Street. Um, do you feel that the, the design has been uh, altered to, to reduce that? Yeah, look, I think it's um, important to note that um, you know, the majority of the time um, this um, uh, laneway, uh, as proposed, will be op open to the public and will be a, a significant benefit uh, to um, the city. Um, <coughs> the scheme does um, promote the proposition of through site links and uh, this is uh, being proposed for the majority of, of, um, of, the, um, of the waking day. Um, up until 10 uh, up until 10 p.m. Um, most days. So, 
the majority of that time, and this will be a, 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 um, a positive element uh, for the city and its users. In relation to the specific question of entrapment, um, there is obviously improved, uh, there will be improved lighting yep. and furthermore signage uh, about opening um, hours of the connection. And we've also included a condition around the uh, landscaping uh, that will be going into that site to ensure that the, the landscaping solutions don't impede that line of sight from, from Brisbane Street. So we're reasonably satisfied combining all of those uh, elements to uh, result in satisfying any concerns that, that um, UDAP had uh, and more, more importantly officers have had in relation to that, that criteria. Thank you. And uh, in relation to, I think, the Melville Street entrance um, and during works and construction, um, will that be accessible along that footpath? I mean, there was concern about the, the tree roots and, and protection of the, the existing trees, uh, street trees. Is that will be accessible or ha will there be hazards? Well, in, in relation to the Melville Street frontage? I, I think mean, it's I, Melville Street um, that it was brought up in the representations. I can't, can't recall. Yeah. Look, at, um, in terms of uh, the construction methodology, I'm not quite sure that that's been fully finalised and, and what need there might be for um, occupation of the uh, Melville Street frontage. Um, as such, as uh, fairly minimal work um, in terms of the Melville Street frontage. Uh, Brisbane Street, um, I understand that there will be some work um, uh, undertaken on that uh, frontage. Oh, it, it may well be that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly, in, um, so I don't think that uh, that uh, detail has, uh, hoarding plan has been developed at this point in time and that will need to be worked through with the contractor and relevant council officers, but we would want to ensure that um, pedestrian access is maintained as much as possible and, and not impeded. And there are ways in, uh, of achieving that um, under normal circumstances. Okay, and just in relation to um, DDA parking, mm -hmm. um, can we, uh, I mean, is it a recommendation of, or a question to you, do, can we have all of those as DDA compliant, um, or should we have that as advice? Uh, look, I think, um, well, it, it satisfies the acceptable solutions in terms of the allocation, um, and we, you know, in, t in terms of um, 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 sort of DDA parking, that uh, under the scheme it's not uh, necessarily required. Uh, no parking is required under the long-standing council policy, but you could include it as advice. Perhaps, uh, Councillor Harvey, you, you would include that as, as advice, having each of the car parking... Ha having each of the, the car parks as uh, dis DDA compliant, disability compliant, as advice. Oh, look, yeah, I don't mind, yeah. If... if, if yeah, mm -hmm. OK, yep. Thank you. <coughs> And uh, finally, just uh, as a comparison, so um, when we had the, the Maya site, which Council uh, helped fund to, for Maya to get back into the city um, uh, many years ago now, but when that was rebuilt and, and the Icon Centre was built, um, did we include uh, or were car parks uh, part of that inclusion for for those um, th that development? Um, th uh, through you, chair. The, uh, well, to you, chair. Uh, no, they weren't. This has been a long-standing council policy position uh, over 30 years um, in place. That um, the CBD, um, uh, you're not required to provide off-street car parking. We know that um, such uh, large facilities, off-street car parking, can be an impediment to uh, positive uh, uh, retail and uh, um, pedestrian experience. Argyle Street is a classic example. Um, uh, access to that um, uh, off-street car parking facility, it is problematic. 
um, and uh, for a pedestrian experience. And you know, the council policy position has been not to uh, necessarily provide those sorts of facilities um, or require those sorts of facilities in response to um, uh, developments within the city. And I know that we have one, at least one futurist in the, in the room, um, and uh, I'd like to be thinking that we can be be looking at um, uh, the the future of the the city as uh, in a new sort of paradigm or a paradigm shift with with how people get to and from a place. But um, uh, I don't think we are, are there just yet. Um, just just in summary. Uh, I think this development. I haven't spoken yet. Mm -hmm. oh, you want to speak? And I haven't spoken either. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, look, I just wanted. Go ahead, to Councillor Harvey. Yep. I just wanted to speak in favour of the the proposal tonight. Um, it, it it absolutely meets the requirements of the the planning scheme, and we need to separate this development from whatever pe whatever views people have uh, about UTAS. So this is a planning application development application that we need to look at and not get mixed up with what UTAS has proposed for either its Sandy Bay campus or for the for the city. So we're acting as a planning authority here at this particular moment. Um, I'm really pleased that we're, we're going to end up with, we'll hopefully end up with a very good outcome for that building, the old forestry building. Um, I've admired that dome for a long time, and I was also shocked when it was um, allowed to deteriorate like it was, because I used to walk through there, or walk around it, just you know, to observe what it, what it was you know, like inside. And I've also had a few meetings there uh, above the, the canopy of that little forest. So I'm very pleased to see that that will hopefully be restored, and that the rest of the heritage building and the entire site um, will be restored to what I think will be a a very transformational um, project in the city. I'd also like to highlight that it's, according to what we've heard tonight, there's not going to be an influx of 1,850 students coming in to use that building, or people coming in to use that building. <coughs> 1,500 of those num of that number already study in the city or work in the city, so the, the increase in time might be 350 additional people and that also frees up those other buildings that they're currently occupying for other purposes as well. Um, another point I'd like to highlight is that clearly there's a lot more staff and students accessing the facilities in the city by alternative means of transport than driving compared to the Sandy Bay campus where there's much higher rate of people driving to the Sandy Bay campus. I think that's a a really important, important point to keep in mind that this project could end up seeing a lot less cars on the road than we, than we currently have using UTAS, but that remains to be seen. Um, so I think that's just about covered it for me, but I'll be supporting this tonight, as you, you're, not, you're probably not surprised. But I do think it's a, a very good progressive development for the city of Hobart. And the DA, I think, is really strong. There's not much in the DA that, that um, sits outside of the requirements. So any other developer might have chosen to do a lot more with the site that might be less sympathetic. So I think you've got a very good custodian of that site in the University of Tasmania. So I'm hoping that they can deliver what they've promised us in the development application and on the site visit the other day, which most of the councillors did as well. I was I was amazed at how big the interior of some of those, both the Freedom and the um, the Melville Street building were. So there's plenty of space on that site, and I hopefully, and hopefully it will become a a, um, a bit of an icon you know, um, education facility in Hobart. Thank you, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, the future of the city is uh, probably key uh, to the, this development application. Um, in the memorandum of understanding we had with the university, um, the current memorandum of understanding, we were going to have a social and economic impact of uh, potential university move into the city. That has not been done. Uh, I have that conf confirmed by the CEO a couple of weeks ago. It has not been done. 
although it was in the memorandum of understanding. Sadly, um, I turned up to a site visit on Saturday uh, after being reminded of it three times and for some reason the UTAS did, people did not turn up, so I haven't had the benefit of a site visit. Uh, I have organised one for tomorrow, hopefully if they turn up then I'll have an ability to go through the site. Uh, UTAS tonight has accepted that there is going to be a parking issue and, uh, and accepted that there will be traffic issues. They've offered uh, in the future, possibly, to, uh, to, uh, to alleviate these issues uh, by offering up to 1,600 car parks on other sites. Well, that's not part of the application tonight, so I think we've got to discount it, although I managed to get in an advice clause tonight. Uh, thank you, Alderman uh, Councillor Harvey. Um, I believe that this... Uh, as the panel, the urban design panel, has indicated that this project may have been a major underdevelopment of the site. It is a central location. It would be ideal for residential development. We are denying uh, this site to be used for a more significant development, um, a one to two storey development. Uh, which I think I agree with the panel. It is an underdeveloped site, will be an underdeveloped site, when it potentially could have a lot of more economic impact to the city. Looking at the objectives of the planning scheme, um, which I know the director might say it has no bearing on it, but the objectives of any scheme have a significant bearing. And looking at the objectives of our interim planning scheme, and it's the reason why I'm going to vote against it tonight, or the second reason I'm going to vote against it. Secondly, the first reason is I haven't got this information that other council members have around the table here because they were entertained with a site visit on Thursday afternoon. And I wasn't. I, uh, mine wasn't. Uh, it didn't happen on Saturday. Um, that's the first reason. The second reason is um, that I, I believe the lack of studies, the lack of uh, parking and traffic studies uh, has handicapped my view of this development. I have read the 2018 submission that uh, the university put into the Legislative Council Traffic um, Committee, Greater Hobart, um, uh, our former Lord Mayor uh, Rob Valentine I think uh, was the chairman of the committee, he kindly provided the report to me. Um, and it, it was a preliminary report that said further, a lot more work had to be done to get some, uh, some clear indication of what the effect on traffic and parking for the city is. It was a very preliminary desktop, uh, desktop um, report it, and it, was only, it, it wasn't sufficient for me to, to come to the conclusion that there will be no impact. But as we have the University Knight said there will be an impact They've accepted there will be an impact. As a good custodian of the city, I think we should know that before we make a decision on this application. So I am going to vote against this uh, thing and, and furthermore I'm going to move for deferment because there is a public meeting in about two weeks time over this issue of the university move and I think in the goodwill of the uh, university and the council, we should defer any decisions that have major impacts on the city until that public meeting is over. So I move for a deferment um, of this de consideration of this DA. I'll, I'll put that motion right now. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? No. Show of hands. Those in favour? Briscoe and Alderman Those against? Oh, so Harvey, Councillor Dutta and the Deputy Lord Mayor. Motion is lost. Thank you. Have you finished, Alderman Briscoe? I think so, yes. Right. Alderman Barakas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I think um, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, making UTAS a I'm making Hobart a education city, or is that, sorry, um, making Hobart an education city or a university city. I think that's all well and good, but I think we do need to read what's going into the city in the context of it existing in the CBD um, and making, making sure that, um, you know, there are undoubtedly going to be benefits to this, 
um, and, and, and to other applications. And there will be pressures that are placed on the city because, because of that. And my, my main concern is making sure that these, those pressures are ma managed and mitigated. And obviously the big one, and that is, is the parking issue. Um, I know part of this potentially goes outside the scope of this application itself, but I think it does need to be said that like, it, is, it is the biggest concern. We heard from um, Ms Bloomfield, we heard from other, other representatives that the, um, the perceived impact that a, a loss of access to parking will have on the area will re restrict the ability of the CBD to function as the CBD, potentially. Um, so it was heartening to hear of the intentions of the university to increase the parking stock around their, around their campus, around this, their satellite campuses in the city um, and other sites. I think um, I'll, my, my initial question was going to be how the university can justify a campus of a few hundred people with five parking spots. Uh, but, but I think it is heartening to see that you know, we're going to have parking spots across the road, parking spots further down the road, um, and, and the expectation is that we'll have a larger number of parking spots than currently exists at the existing Sandy Bay campus. Um, I, like Alderman Briscoe, would have loved to be able to place some, some sort of commitment on, on the university to do that. Um, at, at the moment, we do have to rely on their, um, their, their goodwill and integrity to, to carry through on what they've said. Um, I think, um, but, but, but also noting that under the application, we don't have a requirement for these parking spots either. Um, so I, I would very much like to see if they, if they do carry on with what they're saying they will and they do put in these parking spots um, and, and to, the, um, to the number that they're suggesting they will, I think it will potentially mitigate, I think, one of the main concerns of, of this application. Um, as, as to the internal design of the, uh, internal and external design of the building itself, I'm quite comfortable with it. My main issue is the, the potential impact this will have on the, on the city. Um, and I think so long as that is mitigated, that is the, um, th 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 then my main concern here is, is addressed. Uh, I know that there's a lot of concern in the community about this and other UTAS applications and future applications, um, and, and many of those are unfortunately extraneous to this particular issue. I think we do need to um, make sure that we do remain in the scope of this application. I think we, for the most part, have tonight. Um, and, and there might be some people in the community that are disappointed, but the, the reality is we're looking at the application that we have tonight, and when we look at other applications in the future, we'll discuss them as, as they arise. But look, for the, for the moment, I'll be supporting this, and, and I'll say that I think the way that anybody votes tonight shouldn't be read as endorsement or lack of endorsement um, for any of the other things that might pop up in regards to the UTAS um, um, move or whatever we want to call that. Thank you. Councillor Dutta. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I just want to make two points. Firstly, I take uh, into consideration and very seriously the uh, points raised by 96 plus uh, representations. I have read all of them and I understand the frustration and uh, their concerns. And I have those concerns as well, especially when it comes to parking. But I am uh, tonight listening to uh, how the university uh, representatives, representatives have presented that, it gives me some consolation that there will be uh, a solution to this problem. So therefore, I want to make that very clear. I understand the concerns of the ratepayers and those representatives who have made this. The second point I'm making is this. I'm usually very critical with every aspect of the planning scheme and as I have taken this plan and the facts and the evidence and laid them across the planning acceptable solution and the performance criteria, I am quite satisfied that it meets the provisions quite well. And I have great difficulty. Uh, I have looked at it quite critically at different aspects, and I think this application has met that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just, uh, just, I'd just like to say that um, uh, this is uh, the development application that we have before us. It's, it's not one for uh, a residential property. It's not one for an increase in height. Um, it's certainly um, 
l looks to address uh, or, or uh, respect a lot of the heritage issues, not only with the the uh, two two buildings either side of the dome, but also uh, there are there are um, uh, conditions in relation to the art art and craft buildings uh, next door, closer to Elizabeth Street. So I think that's that's uh, an important part of this. Uh, it addresses the other issues around stormwater and actually improves the stormwater coming down um, off Brisbane Street, uh, going down that that gradient uh, of the uh, through the laneway. So I think there's there's somewhat of an improvement there, and I'm. Uh, somewhat heartened to think that there may be uh, uh, some some addressing of the the access issues which were raised as well. Certainly, there are concerns uh, from from many representors. I think um, once there is more information which provides a clearer uh, direction from from the university, uh, some of some of the concerns will be uh, better. Uh, understood and and the way that that the thinking is is going around this as part of the the overall um, move uh, into the city of of students. So, in essence, I uh, support uh, this application. I don't know that I've supported any of the applications that the universities had um, a, as yet for for some of some of the develops developments that we've seen. So. Uh, but certainly what we have before us tonight uh, is, is met with conditions uh, uh, for approval. So I'm going to support this as well. So I'll put the, the uh, motion with uh, those uh, advice clauses. Do you want to hear the advice clauses separately or are you happy to just consider them uh, in totality? In they're included in. Yes, I'm just asking if anybody wants to, to hear them separately. No? Okay. So I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? No. Uh, show of hands. Those in favour? Councillor Harvey, Councillor Dasha, Order and Graphics, Deputy Lord Mayor. And those against? Oh. Carried and with those advice clause, and it will go to uh, full council next Monday. Thank you. Now, committee, are you happy to go go on? We've only got a, or do you want to? Do you need a short break, Councillor Dutta? Oh, I'd like a couple of minutes. Uh, couple of minutes, yes, you. certainly. Uh, we're back in um, at six forty-five, if we could, so because I think we'll be finished room. soon. Yeah.
Yeah. The city planning committee, and uh, I thank everybody for for coming back. Um, Seven point one point Seven point one point two is one five six Newtown Road, and we have a a um, deferral motion. I, for I that. move for deferral. Thank you, Auden Briscoe. It's a procedural. So, uh, I just need to know: is it deferral so that there can be further engagement with the representors? Maybe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, the, uh, the feedback has been light on detail, I have to confess, but um, my understanding is that they uh, will initiate discussions with council officers at the outset, mindful of the feedback that they've received about the representors' comments. Well, well, I'd like there to be engagement with the representors, which I'm not sure w w whether it's occurred or not. Question. Can we send that back through? Certainly to happy to do okay. so. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll move that deferral. Oh, so I'll put that deferral as moved by Alderman Briscoe. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried unanimously. 7.1.32324 Davies Street. I move the recommendation. Thank you, Alderman Briscoe. Discussion? Mr Noy, what sort of impact will there be on um, neighbouring properties? Is it? Is it, I mean, it, to me, it does seem like an overdevelopment of a, a private open space, which doesn't look so private. How, how much, or looks very, very private and internalised, um, how much uh, impact is it likely to have on those neighbouring properties? Um, look, uh, Chair, it's the view of the officers that uh, it is um, minimal and uh, will comply with the requirements of the council. It's relevant to note that it's not uncommon, and this is a retractable uh, awning, uh, and it's not uncommon uncom for uh, umbrellas um, and the like to be on such decks um, and, and to be deployed uh, for shading purposes or, or um, uh, protection from the weather. So we, we don't see this as a major issue and uh, have accordingly recommended approval. And um, it looks like it must, as part of PLN S2, that uh, must uh, the material must achieve light transmittance of between 30 and 40 per cent. So yeah. hopefully we'll give some some um, comfort to to the representors. Okay, so that's as moved by Alderman Briscoe. I'll put that. Those in favour? Those against? Items carried. 7.1.4 is 23 Murrayville Esplanade. Alderman Barakas, thank you. Uh, discussion? Councillor Harvey? So this walkway will be attached to some pontoons and I assume the pontoons are attached to the seabed. Um, I couldn't see any design of how that would be attached to the seabed. Benoit? Yeah. Look, my understanding is that these are... Uh, um, driven in into the seabed um, uh, and which have which has been the approach that have occurred with all of the more recent marina upgrades mm -hmm. um, that they are uh, driven into the into the seabed okay so it'll go up and down on posts that's correct yeah okay. it's a floating it's a floating uh, facility yeah. no i just wasn't sure whether it was floating on chains to the bottom or no, it was, no, no. Okay, if it's no. piled, it's then piled. It, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. A yeah, question oh, two, three, that? chair. Um, I, I did get, receive a complaint on the weekend about oil spillages around this area. Uh, has this got to do? Uh, is this near um, where they can get fuel for their boats? Uh, there is. Uh, there has been a uh, fuel facility approved uh, at this site, and the, also the neighbouring yacht club, and so they are operating uh, in accordance with their um, planning approval. Okay, I might ask a question without noticing the close. Then. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll put the mo put the motion. Those in favour. Aye. Those against. Items carried. We come now to reports. The first report is monthly building statistics, 8.1. Alderman Barakas, thank you to have that receive a note. Any discussion? If not, I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. Item 8.2 is monthly planning statistics, um, 
So that's another report. Councillor Dutta, thank you for moving that. Any discussion? If not, I'll... Uh, just a comment. Um, Briscoe. Thank you, Chair. So if I'm reading this correctly, March to March, just to the end, for the March this year, it was 58 permits. And March last year, there were 82 permits and, and there was $80 million worth in this time there's thirty million dollars. Can can we explain? Oh, it's the two major projects, is it, that made a difference? Yeah. It seems like an um, incredible difference between eighty and thirty, but it's those two major projects. Is that, it's all right? Okay. You don't have to answer the question. I've answered it myself. <laughs> You've answered that. All right. Thank, yes. thank you. All right. So there's no further comments or <laughs> self-explanations. Uh, I'll put that. Those in favour. Those against, items carried. Advertising, 8.3, uh, Ms Abey, anything of note? Thank you, Chair. The two main um, applications to note have been mentioned previously, and that is the application for KFC on Harrington Street and also the uh, whiskey distillery at Mc McVilly Drive. And both of the, those coming to, to Council? Yes, they will. And the so there's a the change of use to visitor accommodation uh, at 117 Warwick Street. Is that? Can you tell me what that is? Is that uh, in a commercial or residential area? Or we have to take that on notice too. Mm. Thank you. Oh, it was 21st of the 4th anyway, yeah. so it's yeah, it's, already it's gone. gone. Okay. Was that approved? Uh, it would be if it, um, if it hasn't uh, come to, to us. us. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Who moved that? Councillor Dutta, thank you. I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. 8.4 is the delegated decision report. Uh, Councillor Harvey, thank you. Uh, I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. Item nine is questions without notice. And we have, um, have any answers? No. Any questions without notice in the open? No. OK. We now move to the end of the, the meeting. Uh, item 10 is closed portion of the meeting. And open, open, closed. Alderman Barra.